Welcome to the Sets of Church Leaders podcast, where we're helping Christian leaders navigate and lead through the cultural issues of our day. My name is Daniel Yang, the director of the Sen and Suit, and we're excited to have with us today Erwin McManus. Erwin's the founder of Mosaic, a church movement based in the heart of Hollywood, and is the acclaimed author of The Way of the Warrior, The Last Arrow, and other leading books on spirituality and creativity. His latest book is The Genius of Jesus, The Man Who Changed Everything. But before we hear from Erwin, let's go to our host, the editor-in-chief of Outreach Magazine and the executive director of the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center at Stetzer. Who has not written an acclaimed book, just to throw that out there. But it's good to hear somebody mention that they're written an acclaimed book, and we're excited to have with us Erwin McManus. I've known I guess I've known you for 20 years in different contexts and different uh, different engagements, but I'm so glad that you're having this conversation with us today. Uh, we're going to, I mean, here we're talking about someone that uh, that you love and I love, uh, and the title of the book is The Genius of Jesus, The Man Who Changed Everything, brand new, just, just out um, weeks ago. And But the start, place I want to start is, is that most people, when they describe Jesus, would use the word, I don't know, Savior or Messiah or, you know, Lord, different things that are maybe even biblical language. Uh, most people don't use the word genius to describe Jesus. Why did you want to focus on the genius of Jesus? Yeah, it is an interesting thing. And by the way, it's great to be with you guys. Thanks for having me. And uh, I immediately, when I first posted a thought on the genius of Jesus, one of the first responses I got was Jesus was not a genius. He was God. And, and I thought, what an interesting response, because if I had said Jesus was compassionate, no one would respond. No, Jesus was not compassionate. He was God. <laughs> and we create these interesting juxtapositions, but mostly when we feel like somehow the divinity of Jesus is being questioned or violated or diminished. And I actually felt that um, talking about the genius of Jesus is a, is a really important conversation about the humanity of Jesus. Uh, I, I, when I started writing the book, I was, it was during quarantine, you know, I was locked in my back house and uh, everything was on shutdown. I live in LA right here in Hollywood. So we were experiencing the extreme level of quarantine and, uh, and, um, and, uh, and all this pandemic. And I had this thought in my mind, how odd that my life has been changed or revolves around this person named Jesus. And that everything I do in my life, everything I think, everything I create uh, is, is somehow informed by this person that lived 2,000 years ago. And, and it's just like, this is a very odd thing when, when you think about just the whole human dynamic. And then this voice was in my head saying, well, what about if he isn't God? And, and then, because I have conversations with myself, that's why I'm never alone. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then the other voice inside of me said, yeah, but even if he's not God, you can't deny the fact that you've been changed by Jesus. And so then I had a follow-up thought, well, okay, let's follow this through. If he's not God and you have been changed by him, then you've been changed by the idea of Jesus. And this led me to this incredible sort of um, uh, space where I started asking the question, all right, I'm gonna lay my convictions and beliefs aside. And I'm gonna ask the question, how is it possible that I've been changed by an idea or someone's idea that, that lived 2000 years ago. I've been studying human genius for probably 40 years. The phenomenon of genius has always been really intriguing to me. And it's been a part of my own life narrative since I was around 11 or 12 years old. And, and I've never seen a single list that, that has Jesus on the list of geniuses. So then my mind started following this up going, wait a minute, if I've been changed by the idea of Jesus, this is the most brilliant idea that has ever formed in human history. It's, it's a stroke of genius. Then why isn't Jesus on a list of geniuses? I mean, da Vinci is the iconic genius, Mozart, Picasso, um, Einstein, Hawking, uh, Bobby Fischer. There, there, are, there are certain people that always make the list of geniuses. And then there are some other unexpected people like um, Gandhi will make the list, and Buddha will make the list, and Mandela will make the list, and, and I've even seen lists where Muhammad was on the list, but never a single time has Jesus ever been listed on a historical list of geniuses, and this drove me to the question, why? First of all, does Jesus, if you remove his divinity, does he qualify as a genius? Does he express this phenomenon of genius? Secondly, if he does, then what is this particular genius? And then even maybe more intriguing, why would he be so overlooked in history as a genius? And that's what drove me to write the book. So when I wrote my first draft, I wrote it 
suspending my own belief and wrote it as if I did not believe in Jesus. I was just studying the historical person of Jesus and, and evaluating him through the filter of genius. And when I finished that, um, that first um, run through, my editor actually asked me, hey, could you go back and interject that you actually do believe so that Christians will not feel distraught by your book? But I actually thought it was a really elegant narrative to look at Jesus without belief from the filter of genius. Fascinating, fascinating. And I think it's worth mentioning that you sort of talked about how some of the things your own, you know, your own creative, uh, you know, the, the source of your own creativity come from, uh, you know, your understanding of the Lord, how he wants you to use your gifts. A lot of people may not know some of the strange things that you have walked in and through. For example, uh, the Doritos commercial, for example, <laughs> you making handbags. I mean, it's kind of a, you kind of, you kind of have a fascinating strange journey, particularly for someone who, I mean, I primarily have known as a pastor, but how, what's the deal with, Dor give, give people a little Dorito story and then some of these other creative things that you've been in. Cause I, I want, again, I'm not saying you're a member of Mensa. You may be a member of Mensa. I'm not saying that, you know, that, that you're going to put the word genius describing yourself, but you've got some genius creativity. Tell us a bit of that. So we help to understand Urban McManus a little better. Uh, well, one, I actually, I still have a fashion company. Uh, it's called McManus Gallery, and yep. I design clothes and uh, mostly men's clothes. And I, I, I love designing. I love creating. I love art. And it's a part of who I am. Uh, I, I, during the pandemic, I wrote a graphic novel. Right now, it's in South America, and we're working on the art. And, and so I have this kind of uh, fictional tale out of the Persian Empire that is uh, coming this year, along with having written The Genius of Jesus. And so during the pandemic, I relaunched a fashion company, I wrote a graphic novel, and I wrote The Genius of Jesus. And, and, and I, uh, probably right now in my life, 100% of my time uh, outside of Mosaic is focused on uh, mentoring and developing um, individuals whose incomes are usually between a half a billion and more. And, and it's because I've worked as a futurist for 40 years, and, and I work at um, at developing high level, high performance individuals. And so I've been in these worlds for a long time. I've owned a film company and a fashion company and a tech company. And I, uh, I was not funded as a pastor. Uh, I was a volunteer pastor. And I would say up to five years ago, my income um, was 99% from outside of the church. And, uh, and, um, and so what a lot of people don't understand is that pastoring was never my occupation. It was always my passion. And so people always say to me, why would a pastor be an artist or do art? And I go, no, you're asking the wrong question. The question is, why would an artist choose to become a pastor? And, and uh, I didn't grow up in church. I didn't grow up in faith. I grew up irreligious. I'm an immigrant from El Salvador. And, uh, I, you know, I, I came to faith as an adult, and I didn't know uh, anything about the church. I didn't know being a pastor was a job. I didn't know people were paid to be pastors. You know, my, uh, my income up to probably the age of I was 33 was never higher than $12,000 a year. And I, I, you know, my wife and I slept on the floor because we we're working with the urban poor, and I worked in the world of drug cartels. And, and you know, so my background is really eclectic. And I never expected my work in the church to fund me or finance me or, or take care of my family. And, and the only reason I actually took on more the identity of being a pastor is when my kids came to me and said, you don't let anybody call you a pastor. You don't let anyone call you pastor. And we think that if you would identify yourself more as being a pastor, more really cool, edgy, inventive, creative people would want to become pastors too. And and, and that's actually one of the reasons in the last, probably only the last five, six years, have I actually even allowed myself to be called a pastor. And, and that's because, you know, my kids came and said, hey, people want to be fashion designers because you're a fashion designer. They want to be a filmmaker because you're a filmmaker. They want to be a futurist because you're a futurist. They want to be a writer because you're a writer. No one wants to be a pastor because you don't identify yourself enough as a pastor. And, and so I wanted to change that because I wanted people who were intrinsically more um, inventive, creative, innovative, who maybe were more on the edge and fringe of culture to say, oh, you know, um, serving through the church is a really great place for me 
to use my gifts and talents. And, uh, you, you know, Ned, I've always, I mean, we've been intersecting for decades now, you know, and, 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 and frankly, I've seen your influence expand so dramatically in such a powerful way. It's really astonishing and wonderful to watch. And, and so you understand the, 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 the frequencies at which the church kind of operates. And, and, uh, and one of the challenges for me is, you know, I, I've just never actually fit into modern Christianity very well. Mm-hmm. And um, I, people would ask me, in fact, recently uh, I was talking to Sheila Walsh and she said, I remember meeting you 15 years ago on a panel and there was eight of us on the panel or so, and we would all answer the question, then you would answer it completely different than any of us. <laughs> And she said, I, I never, I'll never forget you because she goes, you just never answered anything the way we would expect you to answer it. And I would get asked, what are the techniques you use to think outside of the box? And, and, I, and I remember even when I was young, I said, you don't understand. I don't have any techniques to think outside of the box. I have techniques to try to think inside of the box. Hmm. And I think my great distress when I became a Christian and then when I became, you know, started serving as a pastor, was I wanted to belong so badly to the church. I wanted to belong so badly to Christianity. Like my, my, my dilemma wasn't, I wasn't trying to break out and be rebellious and be different. I was so desperately trying to belong and to be accepted. But every time I opened my mouth and every time I created something, it felt as if it was a violation of the entire culture of Christianity. And, uh, and, and I think I had to kind of grow up and finally decide one day, I, I just, I can't live a life of obligation. I have to live a life of intention, and and whether I ever fit into the the frequency of Christianity, um, I have to just be true to what I I hear um, Jesus speaking to me and what I see needs to be created for the future. Hmm. You know, Aaron, I mean, I can attest to the fact that like your creativity. I mean, you really have inspired a new generation of church leaders and pastors, and I, I can I can attest to that because of the number of church planners that are creatives and artists that got into the ministry because of yours in particular. So when I think about you, I mean, that's kind of your genius is your ability to inspire, your ability to take people from uh, different, you know, sectors of, of industry and, and focus them towards faith and humanity. But in your perspective, though, as you think about like genius, like what makes somebody a genius? And then and then let's put Jesus into that. Like, does Jesus fit into those labels uh, in our categories of what a genius is? Sure. You, you know, it's interesting it, with all the research I've done over so many decades, even writing this book, wrapping your brain around what a genius is, is not easy. It, it's, it's one of those interesting things where it's hard to describe what beauty is. You just know it when you see it. And, you know, because the phenomenon of, geez, of genius is really someone who violates our view of reality. They, they violate our, our, our view of what's possible. And they, they, they change the, uh, the measurement of greatness. And I think one of the great challenges of genius is that geniuses make brilliant people look ordinary. And, they, they, and you know, so you have Mozart, and he makes every other composer of his time uh, look ordinary, even the best of the best. And, and so in the book, I describe certain characteristics of geniuses. Um, they're always heretical. They violate the present view of reality, whether it's Picasso with art or Da Vinci uh, with invention or whether, you know, it's, um, it's uh, you know, Mozart with composition or, or, or maybe it, it, whether it's, you know, Tarantino with filmmaking. Geniuses always become heretical and they violate orthodoxy. Um, they always transform their field. After their life, that particular genre is no longer measured by anything before them, but only by what they created, and then it goes forward. And and so, you know, Newton sets an entirely new view of the world, but once Einstein lives, Newton's thinking almost becomes irrelevant. And and, and so you find that geniuses have a way of being transformative in their field there. Um, and, 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 you know, there's a lot of things that inspire genius, but um, but one of the powerful things to me about looking at Jesus is like, does Jesus actually qualify within this framework of genius? Uh, and, and one of the challenges is that genius always has to have a domain. You, you wouldn't know Mozart was a genius if, he, if there wasn't for music. You could hear his genius. And you, you wouldn't know Da Vinci was a genius until you see the Mona Lisa. You see and experience the genius. 
you would know that Bobby Fischer, Fischer in a sense, would be a genius until you watched it on the canvas of a chessboard. And, and then we go, what's Jesus's canvas? Like he doesn't, he's not a musician. He doesn't write books. He hasn't studied physics. You know, there's not a mathematician. Uh, where is the genius of Jesus? And, and what really struck me is the reason it's so easy to overlook his genius is that his canvas is the human spirit. That where Jesus's genius is actually translated is in the transformation of individuals. And, and that's why it can be so easily missed because we were not really looking at ourselves as the canvas from which a genius is expressed. And one of the things that to me is so fascinating is that uh, genius, as frustrating as it is to me, is not transferable. And, uh, you know, because if genius was transferable, I would spend my entire life in the presence of some genius and, and let that genius sort of wash over me and change me. But you could spend your entire life with, you know, with uh, Monet and never learn how to paint. And you, you, know, you could spend your entire life with John Lennon and never learn how to write yesterday. I mean, the reality is that genius is not transferable except when it comes to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And this is why I felt this book was so important, that is that the genius of Jesus is actually transferable. And only after I wrote the book did I realize I've spent my entire life trying to always find human language for religious uh, jargon. And how do you talk about transformation in, in just human language. And it really is about transferable genius. That what makes Jesus a genius is his ability to elevate what it means to be human. And then he places within us the capacity to actually be elevated in our humanity. And, and as I wrote the book, I felt like this is the most important work I've ever created in my life, because I think even for people who do not believe in God, it gives them an accessible language to understand what God does when you enter into a relationship with him. Okay, so um, let's kind of push down that premise a little more, because it is interesting that if you ever go to something like a Mensa meeting, um, there are some people who are amazingly high capacity individuals, and then there are some people who are just their genius has actually led them down a path where they can't find their way home. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's an interesting thing that you're walking through when you look in the book at some, some ways in which Jesus fit that characteristic. And you have the geniuses you gave are all the geniuses that we look at and say, well, those were geniuses. And, and you know, there's a, here's, there's a mix. Mm -hmm. But do you think that some of the signs of Jesus' genius were even in his childhood? What do you begin to see in his life? What makes you say, this is where I saw the genius of Jesus? In addition to, you said, you know, transferable to our lives, but what about it in the text? What does that look like? Well, in the way the book is broken down, there's actually six chapters at the end that deal with six strokes of genius, six arenas where the genius of Jesus transforms the way we engage life and, and relate as humans that um, are actually transferable. But when you talk about um, how genius emerges, the chapter two of the book, chapter one is just on genius and breaking down the concept of genius, what it is, and does Jesus qualify? Chapter two is actually called Prodigy, because one of the interesting historical dynamics is that, you know, you end up with a, a six-year-old who's a world-renowned violinist or a, an eight-year-old who now understands complex physics or, um, and, and you have this prodigious kind of dynamic in the genius. And usually, oh, and, and there's some fascinating studies where um, the, the inherent genius in people is usually lost by the age of 12, and you have Jesus going to the temple at the age of 12, and you see this window into his genius, where the, the greatest minds of his time, who are all having these philosophical and theological conversations at the temple, because really the temple is the, the Hebrew version of the Acropolis, where the great minds come together and debate the great issues of life. And now you have this child, Jesus, astounding them with his questions. And so you see the prodigious um, essence of Jesus, even at the age of 12. And, and, and you understand that that intentionality was found at a very, very early age. And I think for me, that's really exciting. By the way, the reason I think this chapter is important is, um, well, for example, there, is a, um, there was a man named George Land who was hired by Nassau 
to identify geniuses so that they could hire them for you know, space exploration. So he created what was called an, a genius assessment and they gave it to five-year-olds. And what they found was 98% of those five-year-olds tested out as geniuses. And so they did a longitudinal study and followed those five-year-olds so they were 10 years old. By the time they were 10, only 30% of them still tested out as geniuses. They followed them five more years, and when they were 15 years old, only 12% of them tested out as geniuses. They did a further study of adults around the age of 31, and only 2% of them tested out as geniuses. So what you find is that there's inherent genius in humans, and that genius is lost. So it's not about how do I make you a genius? The real question is, how do I stop the world around you from diminishing or destroying um, or sub, um, uh, sublimating the genius that is intrinsically within you. And I can give you a few undeniable examples of your genius that you may be completely unaware of. Because when I talk to most Americans, and I'm from El Salvador, so English is my second language, uh, I ask them, you know, are you a linguistic savant? Pretty much across the board, everyone says no, especially in the States. And uh, because you only speak one language. I, I, and, and yet the reality is that English is one of the most difficult languages in the world to learn. It's a really complex language. And you learned that language when you were two. And you really had a great mastery of that language by the time you were six. And so what I know is that all the characteristics, all the essential ingredients to be a linguistic savant were actually in you. And if your brain, had believed that you needed five languages to survive, you would have learned five languages. And Ed, I could have, if you would have been moved from the United States to Japan, you would have learned Japanese as if you were a genius at the age of three. And if they'd moved you to Brazil, you would have learned Portuguese or, or Philippines, you would learn Tagalog because your brain didn't know, it didn't have the capacity to learn any language it needed. But what happens is by the age of 12, our brains actually rigidify and we tell our brain what we need to survive. And by that time, we begin to concretize. And what's fascinating to me is that the same kind of studies show that about 98% of children are naturally divergent thinkers. And by the time you're 12, only 2% are divergent thinkers. And almost every human being becomes a convergent thinker. We, be, we, we are born with the ability to see a thousand possibilities and once we grow up, we only know how to fill in the blank. Hmm. You know, I'm, I'm really tracking with you, Erwin. I, I really uh, love that idea of, um, you know, how God's created us with this innate genius. And so uh, a lot of our listeners are, are trained seminarians. So they, they want to go to the text, right? They want to know uh, <laughs> how the Bible supports this idea. And, you know, so Jesus as the creator, that's probably something that they, they get, right? So there's a lot of important titles for Jesus. But, you know, technically, like it's not in the text, like Jesus, the genius isn't in the text. So does it even matter? I mean, what would you say to that? Well, one, uh, we have seminars there that, preach, that teach the Trinity, but that's not in the text. And, uh, and you were teaching all this stuff about the end times. It actually isn't in the text. We, we know more about the second coming than the Bible does. So I've never known theologians that have any problem going outside of the text and pretending it's in the text. Just 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 this. Just to state that as an as an issue. Just, just so we're <laughs> clear, we would say the Trinity is in the text, just not the word. Okay, say, but I got gotcha. you. I got what you're saying. All right. I would say but the Godhead is right, in the text. Right, fair. But you're saying you there's inference here. Yeah, what I'm saying is that many of our theological positions are actually built on on an, uh, a construction of okay. truth in the scriptures. Okay. The reason we haven't really seen the genius of Jesus is that that construction has never been meaningful to us. And if, because I don't know how you could read the Bible and not think that God is inherently a genius. How, in fact, just take a moment and think, how absurd would it be to say humans can be geniuses, but God is not? Sure. <laughs> right? You know, yeah. and uh, I mean, if you just step back and go, the, the question just seems moot, right? If there's any expression of genius in the world, it means it's an expression of the image of God. And in fact, what I would say is that genius is the aberration that reveals to us the capacities that have been lost to us because of our broken relationship with God. Now, let me give you a theological um, basis for that. Before the fall, God says to Adam, there was not even Eve yet, to name all the animals, to, yeah, to name all the species. And so Adam doesn't have a computer. 
He doesn't have, you know, he doesn't have no pad. He doesn't have anything. And he has to name every animal on the earth. And so I'm thinking the mental capacity to be able to remember the names of every animal he saw would be extraordinary. And, and then not only that, but the creative capacity to keep thinking up of names is extraordinary. And so when I look at that small window of human capacity before the fall, what I have to wonder is it, maybe our, our view of, of human history is wrong. We, we tend to think of humans evolving and getting better. Maybe we actually digress from the fall and what we've been going through is a reclamation of what was lost. Mm. And, and you know, so I, I can't even remember a phone number anymore because my, I have all my phone numbers in my iPhone. Right. The only number I remember now is mine. I, can't, I don't remember my wife's or my kids, but 20 years ago, I, I remembered everybody's phone number. In fact, when I was in college one time, just for fun, because I would do this all the time, I, I went to a room, there's like 150, 200 people. And I said, um, and I was there with a friend. And I said, everyone, give me your name uh, real quickly. And then every single person in the room gave me their name, bam, 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 bam. And then I said, everybody move. And I put every single person back in the the exact place where they were seated or standing and told them their name. And I did that in a matter of minutes. And, and it's not because I'm a genius. It's because I actually used my memory. And I, had, I, I recognized that I had this capacity and I built this muscle. Now I can barely remember how to get home, you know, because I have ways, I have Google Maps, I have contacts. Everything you, you tell your brain, you don't need to lose. Mm. And, you know, we're all created in the image of likeness of God, even when we don't believe in God, that image is still within us. Hmm. We should not be shocked that human beings suddenly have this phenomenon of an expression of the divine. And one of the quotes I love is uh, that is on the book is, um, in fact, I think it's on, on the back of the book. It says that if, um, if all genius is touched by madness, then it is also touched by the divine. And, and I, I think that one of the realities is that uh, the reason so many times we look at a genius and we think, oh, wow, this is not a good human being, <laughs> you know, or we go, wow, this person is a genius, but they're also a jerk. And is that our, our ability to handle the capacity of genius without uh, the foundation of character is uh, devastating for us. Yeah. No, I and, and I think yeah. so many times what happens is, is genius gives us a shortcut from having to develop our humanity. And, and, I, and I think one of the beautiful things about Jesus is that he actually makes the humanity the genius. Yeah. Yeah. No. Okay. I like that. I like, I like the, the reflection, that spark of the divine. Um, one of the things that's, that's in the book, it's, I'm going to read a quote. It says, if you choose to embrace the genius of Jesus, you will never see the world the same again. You will never see people the same again. You will never mm -hmm. see yourself the same again. So what is it about embracing the genius of Jesus that would lead you to see the world, yourself, and others differently? Yeah, I, I, what I do sometimes, is I try to just break things down to the simplest, raw beginning. And, you know, I, I'm 63 years old now. I've lived a long time. I've seen a lot of life. I've seen a lot of people um, rise and fall. And what I, I begin, and, and, I, and I've had the opportunity to work um, for years among the urban poor, and I've had the opportunity to work with some of the richest people in the world. And one of the things I, I began to realize is the dumbest decisions you'll ever make will not cost you money, they will cost you people. And, and there are so many times I tell myself, how did you do that? I mean, how were you so dumb that you would make that decision and not realize it would destroy everything in your life, every relationship, everyone that mattered. And I realized, wow, money cannot buy you the kind of relational intelligence that you need to live a life that's fulfilling. And so I, I can tell you, I've met person after person after person with incredible financial success and, um, and you know, success in so many fields of endeavor and they're hollow and empty inside and their lives are, are uh, almost in their minds unreclaimable. And, and one of the things I really wanted to help people realize is that the genius you need most is the genius of human connection, of how to relate to other human beings. And, and when you have that genius, then you have the basis from which you can build other things as well. 
And, you, you know, I, I, in this meeting, I was just in uh, the hundred guys in the room, all making a hundred million dollars a year uh, minimum. And, uh, and they were asking me like, why do I, why should they think the genius of Jesus is important? And I said, Hey, for you, here's the bottom line. I'm going to teach you how not to die alone. And because one of the things that genius of Jesus will help you do is to, to die with meaningful relationships in your life, because you've made people the most important value in your life. Hmm. Hmm. I, I'm really curious, uh, Erwin, as you were studying this and this became, you know, a, a big theme for you, like, wh what did this do to you personally? Like, how did it change your view on different things like empathy and human can, like, what, what was it about the study of this that really impacted you personally? Well, I, I think it, it impacted me on, on multiple levels. And some of them are almost like too awkward to talk about in some ways. And, um, uh, you know, by the time I was 12 years old, I was in a psychiatric chair and uh, I was a straight D student first through 12th grade and I was an incredible underachiever and uh, was even told I was retarded and, um, and, and wondered, you, you know, if I just really did not have like the mental capacity to, uh, to even function or succeed in the world. And I was, I was pretty neurotic, maybe even at times on the hinge of, of being psychotic and um, and I've been married now almost 40 years. And I can tell you, there've been times my wife has literally come to me and said, what happened to you? Like something changed in you. And, and I, I, the longer I've walked with Jesus, the more boundaries in my life have been erased of limitations. And, and I don't know any other way to put it, but I, I, I feel that coming to know Jesus has made me smarter has unlocked my mind, has opened my imagination, has, has changed the, the basic construct of, of who I would have been as a human being. And, 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 and so without like overstating it, I, I know that we always feel like Jesus wants to have big hearts, but we always, it seems like he, we want him, he wants us to have big hearts and small brains. And, uh, and I actually think that God wants to expand our imagination. He wants to expand um, our, our curiosity, he wants to expand our capacity um, to think most deeply because the greatest level of wisdom necessary is uh, really in human uh, interactions. And so one of the ways that changed me is I walked away with, from this going, wow, um, even if I didn't believe in Jesus, I would, I would want to be changed by him. I, and it made me have a greater admiration and affection and love for who Jesus was just as a person. And, and it made me more convinced that all the violence, all the, the chaos and all, all the, um, the, the challenges that we're facing as a society is that the singular geni genius that can fix this is Jesus himself. And, and so when I wrote those um, chapters on the different strokes of genius, there were certain points where I was, I was just going, I finally understand. It's almost like I was identifying the compass that has guided me throughout my life without having ever articulated it. And that for me was really exciting. Okay, so um, the, of course the book, just to remind everybody where we're talking about, we're talking about the, the genius of Jesus, the man who changed everything, the book's out in September, 2021. Um, and of course, Erwin has written some just books that have been very uh, impactful, influential uh, inside the Christian church and outside the mm -hmm. Christian church. Some of you are familiar with uh, past books. He's written the, uh, the way of the warrior, not too long ago, the barbarian way, um, probably one of the better known ones and more. Um, so, you know, our, our audience is pastors and church leaders. That's, that's who we're sure. mainly talking to. So if, if you're a pastor and church leader, you know, when I hear a lot of this, this seems to me to be, um, could be the starting point of a conversation about someone who might be trying to understand Jesus, become a follower of Jesus. Is, is that part of why you wrote this is to explain uh, Jesus? And does it lead them to a deeper understanding of how they might respond to him? Or how does that work? Yeah, I, I had two really strong um, intentions when I wrote this book. Uh, one is that I, I spend a huge part of my life talking to people who don't believe in God. And in fact, one Easter, we did a survey at Mosaic. And I said, how many would say you're atheists? But if God were out there, you'd be open to discovering that. We had over a thousand people on Easter say, I'm an atheist, but if God's out there, I'm open. 
That's, that was how many self-identified atheists. There could have been others that said, I'm not open or you know, I'm not willing to disclose, but I was, I was just shocked. And, and I've had so many people tell me the years when they come to Mosaic and they're a Christian, they always feel like it's an away game for them you know, <laughs> because it's not full of people who already believe. And, and one of the questions I get all the time is, one, you know, can you talk to my friends about Jesus? Because, you know, I, I don't know if anybody else could help them come to know Jesus. And I'm going, I can't be everywhere at all times. But two, um, people ask, can you teach us how to do this? And this book is an elegant way of helping a person learn how to talk about Jesus in a new, fresh, uh, um, you know, with a new, fresh narrative where a person without God won't be so uh, pushed away by what they consider to be our um, our judgmentalism or, or, or our rigidity or dogma. And so I wrote this book, one, so that people who care about people without Jesus would have something that could say, hey, read this book. Here's a new, fresh perspective on Jesus. And um, it's, it's, it's basically like an anthropological um, um, study of who he was and, and what his genius was. And, and, and I think there are people who would study da Vinci and people who would study Picasso if they could extricate their genius in the same way. I would study the genius of Buddha. I wish I could get inside of the brain of Buddha. I wish I could get inside of the brain of Mandela more. I, I think one of the ways that you grow and learn is when you, you know, when you choose a mentor through learning about their life and their thinking. And this is a way a person can, um, can actually, who doesn't believe, can actually, I think, access um, who Jesus is in a way that removes all these non-essential barriers. And I, I, but I also think that a lot of Christians are living way beneath their God-given capacity. And, and without writing a book about self-help, this book is not about, you know, five steps to become richer, or five steps to become more successful, or five steps to have a better marriage. All those things would be great. I just didn't write those books. Uh, this book is really, here's the process to becoming the best version of yourself where the image of God is fully reflected in you in such a way that it creates a dynamic chemical reaction in you that produces the most good in the world. And, and, I, and so I, I think, I mean, I, I know it's hard to say this, but like, and I feel like I, this is the most important thing I've done in my life. Hmm. And um, in 2000 years of writing about Jesus, no one has ever written about the genes of Jesus. This is, this is not a rehashing or a retelling of, a perspective on Jesus has been um, overworked. And, and I actually think in this moment's time, um, it, it's, it's, it's both timely and timeless in the way it can impact people's lives. Mm. Oren, thanks so much for uh, being with us and for sharing with us uh, your genius and your creativity. You've been listening to Erwin McManus. Be sure to check out his book, The Genius of Jesus, The Man Who Changed Everything. You can learn more about Erwin and his book at thegeniusof.com. That's thegeniusof.com. And thanks again for listening to the Sets of Church Leaders podcast. You can find more interviews as well as other great content for ministry leaders at churchleaders.com. And if you found our conversation helpful today, we'd love for you to take a few moments to leave us a review on iTunes that help other leaders find us and benefit the content from the content more. And you can find this podcast as well as other great Christian podcasts on Faith Play app available for both Apple and Android. Thanks for joining us today. See you on the next episode.